Well, this is gonna be a popular video. Hey guys, it's Clay from Clear Critique. Let's talk about the most overlooked Bond actor, Timothy Dalton. Hardcore fans aside, most people don't discuss the two Bond films this guy was in, and I can't really blame them. This brief arrow is less flashy, more understated, and simply doesn't draw the eye like, well, this. Yet I think these movies deserve a second look, so today I'm gonna compare Dalton's two Bond films. License to Kill, and The Living Daylights. Two films, seven categories, let's roll. Both of these movies are notably plot-centric. The Living Daylights follows Bond assisting the defection of General Koskov from the Russians, but later discovering he's in fact a double agent and has to team up with Koskov's girlfriend and the Mujahideen to stop him. In License to Kill, Bond's friend Felix Leiter and Leiter's wife are murdered by drug dealer Fran Sanchez. Bond goes on a revenge mission, losing his 00 status in the process by infiltrating Sanchez's operation. There's a lot of similarities with these stories, and while the focus on plot makes both films less fun for certain stretches, I think the stories function well for the most part. But saying that, there are two lines that have not aged well. It's called a ghetto blaster. Just let it happen. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ugh. The biggest difference is that The Living Daylight's story starts very strong, but becomes worse as it goes on, while License to Kill starts very sloppy, but steadily improves. There's a good 20 minute period in License to Kill, starting around the casino, when I sat up straighter in my chair and thought, whoa, this is getting really good. It's a great setting, and Bond pulls the equivalent of a flower powdered pimp slap here. Miss Kennedy. Would you get me a medium dry vodka martini? What a Shaken, dry... not stirred. Oh man. And after that, Q arrives with some gadgets that, at least for a Bond flick, come across as grounded and believable. 007 transforms the camera into a rifle, squats into sniper position, and an eerie calm settles over the night. At that moment, the stakes, the reality of the situation, have me fully invested, oh my god, ninjas. <laughs> what? <laughs> ninjas? I know it's the 80s, but why? <laughs> License? You were doing so well. The film thankfully gets back on its feet when the main deception plot starts rolling, and I'd say between the two films, License has better dialogue. Your uncle? Let's make this a proper family reunion. Give me a gun. So for a stronger sense of intrigue and moments of flair, License gets the point. Someone commented with the perfect summation of what different actors brought to the role and how they were written. Dalton is the serious one. We all know this, but don't for one second think that makes him circumspect. It doesn't. This is a bond they ran out of shits to give before the opening credits. And nowhere is this better exemplified than in this scene from License to Kill. Bond sneaks aboard this boat right, opens the door to the other deck and finds himself surrounded. There's a guard here, who's coming aboard, another here, behind him, a man at a lookout point above, and a few others here in the rafts, and none are yet aware of his presence. So, you're a secret agent. What do you do? A. Slip back into the room and devise a plan. B. Quietly take out the first guard, drag his body into the room and wear his uniform. Or C. Shoot the guard at point-blank range with a fucking harpoon. Compliments of Sharky. Jesus! In these two films, he chucks half-naked girls at henchmen, disobeys direct orders that easily could have gotten someone killed, and plants explosives in a plane that he then pilots, and I swear, at one point, he just forgets about it and disarms it with seconds to spare. This kind of recklessness is very fun to watch. Saying that, I feel Dalton's bond is at its best when he's methodical. In The Living Daylights, especially in the first half, Bond comes across like an actual spy. Less quips and cocktails and more focused on the plan at hand. I mean, look at how he says the infamous line. Who are you? Bond, James Bond. He's a very different and relatable Bond. And in The Living Daylights, we get that at its best. I don't know how accurate this is, but I've read that The Living Daylights specifically avoided a lot of sexual encounters because of the AIDS epidemic. Of all the Bond films, I'd say this one is up there with Spectre as the least sexiest. 
There's only one Bond girl, and what romance there is feels dull and uninspired. Kara is a rather forgettable love interest, even with the caveat of being a failed assassin. Their dialogue is dry, and Mariam Diabo doesn't bring much to the character other than that frazzled, wide-eyed expression that's almost a Bond girl stereotype. License to Kill sports two Bond girls, Pam Bouvier and Lupe Lamora. They both neatly fit into the Betty Veronica archetype. Bouvier is the sweet girl who's better suited to care for Bond, but Lamora is the exotic, dangerous one that Bond will probably text while Bouvier is in the bathroom. She reminded me of Severine from Skyfall, both being abused lovers of the villain, but this movie takes it a step further and actually shows the abuse, which shocked me the first time I saw it. In some ways, she's still attached to Sanchez, out of past love or fear, and yet she still tries to help Bond, but cautiously, in small doses, to protect herself. Kara is forgettable, Pam is fine, but Lupe is an intriguing Bond girl that seals the point. Also, when in doubt, just put your Bond girl in a red dress behind a blackjack table. You can't lose. Sanchez from License to Kill may be the most underrated Bond villain. See, I enjoy the operatic Bond villains like Elliot Carver and Raul Silva, but it's not all I enjoy. What makes Sanchez such an engaging character is that he isn't evil, psychotic, traumatized, or hell-bent on revenge. He's just... kind of a dick. The film lets the quirkiness fall to the main henchman, played by Benicio Del Toro, who has my favorite line in the film. Don't worry. We gave her a nice honeymoon. When Bond pretends to defect to the villain's side, there's a real bromance between them. Sanchez genuinely trusts and likes Bond, and their chemistry in script and on screen is so fun to watch that at one point I thought, hell, just join the bad guys. A bold twist to be sure, but it honestly would have made the movie better. Not until Skyfall have we gotten this close to an intimate Bond villain relationship. I'm aware I'm reading into this, but the way Sanchez wakes up Bond after an assassination attempt is almost tender. Hey sleepyhead, I got rid of those pesky assassins and have some eggs Benedict cooking on the stove. Ugh, oh, you know me so well, babe. Mwah. In fact, if you were to argue that Sanchez's main henchman hates Bond in a jealous, jilted lover kind of way, you'd have evidence at your disposal. As for the living daylights, it's slim pickings. There's a henchman who carries balloons, because apparently this film, like the original It, think balloons are somehow menacing, which they are not. Then there's General Koskov, who we learn is a villain later on, and there's a clear reason why this doesn't work. He's introduced as someone Bond needs to protect. He's a gray suit, the helpless idiot you have to escort in a video game. So when he switches sides and doesn't bring much to his performance, he's still that bland character. The only bad guy that halfway works is Whitaker, the transparently slimy gun dealer, who at least brings some energy to these scenes. Sanchez is not only entertaining, but I place him in the top 10 Bond villains ever. And if that's a list you want to see a video of, please let me know in the comments. Honestly, his chemistry with Bond is enough to warrant a watch of the film by itself. License to Kill's first third suffers from a lot of lame and tame aqua combat, and that's not even the biggest issue. <sighs> we need to talk about the bar scene. Fans of this movie won't want me to, but I'm sorry, it, it has to happen. What the hell is this scene? The scene could have worked. Bond and Bouvier are surrounded by henchmen, and they have to quickly fight their way out could have been tense and effective, but instead, it turns into Three Stooges at the Bayou. I'll just list what this five-minute scene contains. Bond drinking cheap beer, a fight with a swordfish, a stripper still dancing while the brawl is going on, and a shotgun blasting a Looney Tunes-sized hole in the wall. This scene goes well beyond Moonraker goofiness and dives deep into Derp Town, and halfway into it, I just tossed my hands in the air. <laughs> Living Daylight starts a lot stronger. First, Bond is introduced during war games, and one of the participants starts killing the other players for real. Then there's a car chase, and Bond ends up landing on a boat and grabbing a drink. After this, Bond links up with an agent at an opera house, and they discuss their plan to protect Koskoff against a sniper during a tense 10 second window. Bond disables the sniper, changes the escape plan, and Koskoff is shot through a transport tube. This is the highlight of the realistic spy setting I mentioned earlier. Apart from breasty booby tits over the top seduction bit, all the action feels grounded, and while I didn't care for the shootout at the end, it was interesting to see militant Afghans depicted as the heroes, which makes sense given the time period. We also get a neat scene toward the end involving a series of traps, something I really wish more Bond villains would utilize. Neither film excels at action, 
but The Living Daylights has more bright spots and a significant lack of... Both Dalton flicks don't offer much in terms of style. I'll give License slight credit and say there's a nice balance between light and dark in the aesthetic. The scores do the job, but nothing jumps out as exceptional, and the editing is bland bordering on bad. As far as theme songs, The Living Daylights by AHA is okay. Catchy chorus, appropriate length, but none of the visuals are striking or even interesting, especially the slightly bubbled water, which is about as tepid an image as you can get. However, License to Kill rules. The chorus is classic 80s ballad, which works fine, but it's that main hook that rolls in like thunder. Disregarding theme songs, one film sparks from time to time, and the other flatlines. Point to license. Forgetting technical quality, which movie does a better job delivering that 007 experience? I think the writer of the Bond novels, Ian Fleming, would have enjoyed The Living Daylights. The seriousness of its plot would flex up camp. It feels the most like a spy film out of any of the post-Connery entries. But most of this occurs in the first act. The rest of the movie becomes ridiculous without being fun, and slow without being intense. We could spend hours debating what Bond even is and how it's changed over the years, but to me, it's one of those things that's hard to define, yet can easily identify when you see it and feel its absence when it's gone. The best Bond attribute in Daylights is easily the car, in all its sleek black glory. It's almost a symbol of the Dalton era, the kind of no-frills effectiveness he and the script brought to the character. But it and the spy swagger of the first act isn't enough to take the point. License agreeably seesaws between tones. It's got blackjack, martinis, a femme fatale, an iguana-stroking villain, a camera rifle, and a giant explosion at the end. That's practically a Bond resume. I see how, at face value, these two films seem evenly matched. But it's the certain elements, like the song, settings, and set pieces, that make License to Kill that much more satisfying. I don't expect many to watch this review, as the Dalton duo isn't particularly popular, but if anyone wants to get into the Bond franchise, or already enjoys it, License to Kill is worth a watch. And if nothing I said so far appeals to you, check out that chin. I mean, look at it. It's amazing. I help people with problems. Problem solver. I'm more of a problem eliminator.